call this June 18, 2020 Special Board of Education meeting to order. Mr. Anagnastu, would you take the roll? Mrs. Bissell? Here. Mr. Miko? Here. Mr. Roberts? Here. And Mrs. Housen? Here. All present, would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on our agenda is public comment. I see none. At this point in time, we will move into executive session to consider the appointment of a Board of Education member. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. Mrs. Housem by a hair. Second? Second. Mr. Roberts with the second. George, would you take the roll? Mrs. Housem? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mrs. Bissell? Yes. Mr. Micko? Yes. We will enter into executive session at 7.02 and we will be back. Thank you. It is 7.40 p.m. and we have resumed public session. Next on our agenda is resolution to fill Board of Education vacancy. Whereas a vacancy has been caused on the Board of Education by reason of resignation and whereas this Board of Education has the legal authority to fill a vacancy for the unexpired term thereof. Now therefore be it resolved by a majority vote of all the remaining members of the Board of Education of the Strongsville City School District that Sherry Buckner Salee be and hereby is appointed to serve as a member of the Board of Education of this school district for the unexpired term of June 25th, 2020, ending on December 31st, 2020. Mr. Mick, that's a is that, correction. Uh, do we need to change we that need date? To change it. So I'm gonna adjust that date for the unexpired term of June 8, 18. 18, brain hiccup. June 18th, ending on December 31st, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Motion by Mr. Roberts, second by Mrs. Housem. Any discussion? I will say for the board, uh, once again, we had a, uh, a process that we are blessed in Strongsville we had 12 candidates apply. All 12 were qualified. All 12 could have served ably on this school board. Um, that is a blessing for our city to have that many people willing to serve and to serve well. Our job, once again, is to choose the person that we believe is best for this board and for this school district at this time. And I am happy to report that we have found that person in Sherry, and we're very excited to have her uh, on board for this board. Um, so we welcome her and we're excited to have her. Uh, it goes without saying that we have a lot of excitement in the district and it'll be good to be at full strength and to have her insight as a business owner, as a certified public accountant, as a uh, adjunct professor at a university. These are all great skills that uh, she will be able to bring to bear uh, for the benefit of the students uh, in our district. So we're very excited to have her aboard and we congratulate her. Anybody else? With that, Mr. Anagnastu, would you take the roll? Sure. sure. Uh, Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mrs. Housem? Yes. Mrs. Bissell? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes, and the motion carries. <laughs> So now I turn it over to Treasurer Anagnastu for the oath of office. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Uh, Ms. Buckner, Ms. Buckner, Salih, congratulations. Um, normally, I'm gonna have you go to the podium. Normally I would follow you up there, but uh, for social distancing, I'm gonna stay at my seat. Um, I'm gonna read you the oath of office. Uh, you have a copy you could follow along. So um, please raise your right hand. I, I, 
Uh, state your name. Sherry uh, Buckner Sully. Do solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge my duties as a member of the Strongsville Board of Education to the best of my ability, and in accordance with the laws now in effect and hereafter be enacted during my con continuance in said office and until my successor is chosen and qualified. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Good to have a seat. So, okay. so Sherry, welcome aboard and Thank you. you can take your seat. We're going to have to, you could sign on. our first order of business yeah. will be to get a lighted sign for her. <laughs> Sherry, did you have anything you wanted to say? Oh, I want to thank the board um, for. It's on. I want to thank the board for nominating me. I'm proud to be a part of this community and that always embraced me. I'm proud to be a part of the system. I'm proud that my daughters uh, are were successful students and are one of is still a successful student in this uh, uh, school system. Strongsville High School. Just want to thank you. I really am grateful, and I'm going to do my best, work hard on behalf of uh, Strongsville City Schools. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Next on our agenda is Superintendent's report, Dr. Riva. Thank you, Mr. Miko and Sherry. Welcome. We're thrilled to have you uh, with us, and look forward to meeting with you and talking with you and getting you up to speed with where we're at. Uh, so congratulations again to, to you and your family. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to do today uh, while we were together is to give an update on where we're at. I've got some slides uh, behind me that we can highlight. So uh, with where we're at for the 2020-21 school year and all the planning that's been, that's been going on. So this is a graphic that we've been sharing within our work groups and I've, I've shared with the board and just want to kind of give an overarching big picture perspective of the work that we're doing as we're in these kind of uncertain times of what school will look like. <clears throat> and so as we plan, we need to plan for three completely different environments um, for the 2021 school year. Um, and that first environment that's up there is in-person and in-building learning. So this is all kids coming to school every day uh, as we know it. And I just want to reiterate, I've shared this with the board and shared this with work groups, but for our community as well, is this is what we want to see happen for the school year. We want to have all of our kids back. We want to have our kids back five days a week, adhering to whatever restrictions or social distancing requirements are there. But this is what we're working towards. However, I'll talk about in a minute, there's some restrictions that are not allowing this to happen right now um, and where we're going with that. But th this is the preferred uh, avenue for providing instruction. And if you look at the, the graph that's up there and you move from that, from that upper right-hand corner of in-person, in-building learning through blended through remote learning, we acknowledge and we understand that when you move to blended learning, there's a loss of educational outcomes that are there, whether it's academic, whether it's social emotional, whether it's relationships, that we are not, we cannot recreate all the kids experience and all that they gain educationally, academically, uh, experientially um, in a blended learning. But when, when you look at the restrictions that we have in place, that's the best opportunity we have. Sometimes as an educational leader or as a superintendent, we have difficult scenarios and we have to even though both scenarios may not be the most desirable, we have to select one that meets the best interest of, of the masses, um, and that's what we have to look at. And when we go look at completely remote, that's even more of a challenge. And so what we're looking at is in those, if we cannot have in-person, in-building instruction for all kids every day, how can we uh, make the most out of a challenging situation, and how can we get the most out of a blended learning experience? And so... <clears throat> A blended learning experience is just, it's that. It's blending a remote experience with an in-person experience into one's, one uh, platform. So what that means is that students would go to school for a certain number of days, and then they would take part in remote learning for a certain number of days. 
And so that's an option we have to plan for. And the reason we have to plan for that option is if social distancing requirements do not allow us to have as many students in the building as possible, or our classroom capacity is exceeded based on six feet uh, social distancing requirements. So if you look at, um, just in, in a basic calculation, we have to, right now the rules say that we have to have six feet social distancing. That means every student needs 36 square feet of space to be social distance. If you take a look at our average classrooms are from 700 to 900 square feet, um, and I can't do it in my head right now, but you know, 700 divided by 36 square feet, it doesn't get to 25 students, uh, which is where we average out. So that's where we're saying we have to have some blended structure. The last part of that graph is remote learning 2.0. Remote learning 1.0 is what we did from March to May. Uh, you know, we had uh, some, sex, some successes, we had some stumbles, um, and so we're looking at how can we evolve that. How can we evolve that in that blended structure where it's going to be you know, part in person, part remote, as well as what happens if there's a spike? What happens if you know, the college model, right, is we're gonna go to college through Thanksgiving and then no kids are gonna come back until after the first of the year? What if something happens and the state says that's what you have to do? We have to be ready to have remote learning five days a week. And so those are all of the aspects that folks are planning on. I mean, I think what sets us apart, uh, and not that we're looking to compare one district to the next, uh, but I think what sets us apart from what some others are doing is that we've put together a structure that not only builds stakeholders throughout the district that has expertise in the areas of different operations, but also allows for parent feedback and allows for community feedback. And so what does that mean? That means our process is gonna take a little longer. Because if, if I would sit in this room with my administrative colleagues and make decisions, I could have a plan out to you already. But if we're gonna sit and we're gonna have a feedback loop and we're gonna, as I talked in my parent communication this week, <clears throat> if we're gonna have 15 plus work groups or, and then we're gonna have friends focus groups and we're gonna have thousands of people providing feedback, that takes time. And so what we've decided to do is instead of rushing and have a small group of people share a plan, we're going to take a little longer and we're going to share our decisions when they're made, get continuous feedback, and have the opportunity to learn from that as we, as we finalize our plan. So some of the things that I just want to update or, and have a discussion on is, you know, the work groups. I, I've shared with the board before, we have work groups throughout the district and our community. We've shared, uh, there's a link, I'll share these slides publicly, uh, but there's a link to a variety of work groups that funnel up to building oversight committees, that funnel to district oversight committees. And you know, I get asked uh, once in a while about, are the work groups working? Is the structure working? Um, you know, maybe I'm a little biased because I was the one that created the structure. Uh, but in, in terms of the things that are being discovered, the problems that are being solved, I can say 100% that the, the solutions that are being developed are much better than it was if I had a small group of people in, in the room. And what we're also doing is building a synergy amongst the communicators that people feel a part of a process that's bigger than just a small group. So um, they are working extremely hard. They're, the pace is pretty quick. They're continuing to turn out decisions and recommendations. Um, and they're taking on big topics as we move forward. So I'm very proud of the efforts of the work groups. Um, and it's been exciting to see the leadership at, at, throughout the entire organization to, to move these decisions forward. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is health and safety requirements. So it, it bears to, as a reminder that the Department of Health, the Ohio Department of Health has, has shared a draft list of health and safety requirements. This is the only information that has teeth to it, that has requirements that says you can or cannot do this. Um, the two big ones in there that we talk about all the time, as currently stated, it says on any school district property, including Buses, you must wear facial coverings or masks at all times. The second one is that you must maintain six feet of social distancing on all school property, buses, etc. Those two masks are one thing, but the social distancing is what necessitate all of these other plans, right? If there was no social distancing requirement, we could all come back to school, um, but that's uh, a part of the health and safety requirements. The governor said earlier this week that within 10 days, they would release the finalized health and safety requirements. We're all working on drafts. And there's a lot of rumors out there as to what the next version of the draft will be. <clears throat> Some rumors state that the face masks and the facial coverings are now gonna be strongly recommended, but not required. Um, 
there has now been rumors that the six feet of social distancing requirement is going to be lessened a little bit. Um, but it would, the, the governor said he'll announce it in the next 10 days. There was rumors it was going to be today. That didn't happen. Uh, the next indication is that he's going to announce them at his Tuesday press conference. So we'll see what happens on Tuesday. But that is going to be a major decision point um, for us um, and where we go. Uh, and the main part is what's going to be the social distancing requirement. So before I go on with some discussion topics, any questions or comments or feedback from the board on what I've covered so far? Okay, keep going. Uh, for, so for in-person and in-building learning, some of the things that we're talking about is, you know, what will be the social distancing requirement? Will, will it look the same in prior years? So what I want to share with the board is that based on, we've gone through our entire district and measured all of our classrooms. We know the square footage in each of the classrooms, each of the large space areas, and you know, there's a calculator that's out there online that you, know, you could do the math, but there's a calculator that says, you know, how many kids do you need to fit, and it'll spit out, you know, here's how much square footage you need, or here's the square footage you have, here's how many kids you could fit based on these various levels of social distancing. If the state lessens, or if we have the ability to lessen to five feet social distancing, we could fit all kids back every day in almost every building in our district. So the difference between needing 36 square feet for every student versus 25 square feet for every student is a game changer for us. Um, so we will see what that happens. And you know, there's been some other districts that have released, and I like the idea of uh, you know, if we can get to four or five feet social distancing, here's our plan. If the state says six feet social distancing, here's our plan. Um, so that's one of the things that's going to be a key decision point for us. But uh, what I want to share is even if the social distancing requirement is lessened and let's say we can go with five feet and get all of our kids back, school is not going to look the same. What that means to me and what we're talking about within our work groups is we need to assure that we're still providing a safe and healthy environment for our, our students. So if we can socially distance in a classroom, that doesn't mean that we won't have restrictions and how are we going to move kids throughout the building? How are we going to get kids on and off buses? What are we going to do at recess? How are we going to serve food? You know, are we going to have the same bell schedule at the high school or middle school? You know, how can we, and this is just me contextualizing, you know, how can we ring a bell and have 2,000 students in the hallways at this high school at the same time? That's probably not going to work. Um, so I, I do want to share you know, and have everybody start thinking about is even if we can get all kids back every day, School is still not going to look the same with the restrictions that we have to put into place for the health and safety of our students. Um, you know, some, we've gotten a lot of questions about renting office space. Like, okay, we get, if, if social distancing is six foot, we can't get more than, you know, 16 to 17 kids in a classroom. Most of our classes are 25 to 30 at the older grades. What about going into Foltz Parkway or somebody said, you know, buying out Sears? Um, or, or not buying it out, but renting the space. Um, so I wanted to let you know that uh, the board has suggested that as well, and we've researched that. Um, we've gotten an average price per square foot of what that would be. Uh, looking at, we've, we've looked at, um, we've looked mathematically, is it possible and could we do it? Um, you know, educationally, I have challenges with saying we're going to have a mass open space and we're going to put all of our overflow into this mass open space and how are we going to retrofit it with dividing that up and how is technology going to work and do we have business partners that are going to want thousands of kids coming onto their property um, with school buses. But just as a, as a starting point to the discussion, to rent the space that we would need um, and to have the additional staffing we would need, a conservative starting estimate is $1.3 million for six months. So that's something that um, as, we as things evolve and, and we change or, or, and, and rules change, if it's something that would warrant further consideration, I think we have to weigh the pros and cons of $1.3 million at minimum is that best served in, in renting space and hiring staff to make that space work? And that doesn't even start to begin to talk about furniture and dividers and retrofitting space. Um, that's just a, a ballpark startup cost. Um, or do we put $1.3 million into other avenues of the organization to help 
with remote learning. Um, so those are things that we have looked at. Um, could it be done? Theoretically, it could be done. I haven't had the conversation with the city officials to say, is there any building that really is open to have it be a, a pseudo school? Um, but I just wanted to share that and give a starting point for the dollar figures that we're looking at. Um, and then the last bullet point is, you know, our question is, will there be any prioritization given to certain grade levels and or students? So one of the things that we've talked about is how do we, how do we prioritize the needs of our youngest learners and our, and our learners with the greatest needs? And so one of the things we've built out as a scenario is starting in the elementary level, preschool on up, if we use all of the available space in buildings, can we get grade levels of students in the building every day, all kids? And so based on our scenario planning, <clears throat> we could get preschool back all for all their normal schedule. There's a, there's a little caveat to preschool. They've just changed the rules uh, for preschool and we're still waiting on guidance, meaning they've come out and said, the State Board of Education has made a decision that uh, Preschools, school-based preschools will follow the same rules as daycare centers, which means there's only a nine-kid student limit per class. What they haven't given us clarity on is we have a preschool that serves the needs of students with disabilities, and there's a law that says there needs to be an equal ratio of students with disabilities and typical peers. So if the limit is nine, one decision is if the state is going to waive the ratio, you could keep, right now we have a ratio of eight and eight. Eight students with disabilities, eight typical peers. Class is 16. We have the space, we could fit 16 in there, socially distanced, but if, this, if the state keeps with the rule, it would be nine. Um, do they, are they, we're still waiting for clarity on, are they gonna require us to keep the ratios, which would mean four and four? Uh, or uh, do we not have to keep the ratios, and then we'd have to make the decision of, do we want to move to be a special education preschool? Uh, because that's all that we would serve. So based on a paper-based scenario, we can open up preschool and be there uh, all four days like we were in the past. Um, we've also worked the scenario that we could have all kindergarten, first grade, and second grade back in our buildings all day, every day. And that's where we run out of space, is we, we do not have any scenario grades three through 12 that we could um, work. We have the space, right, but the, it doesn't work as cleanly as the elementary school. Um, and, and when I say about we can make it work, I want everybody to understand that this, in every building, this is a combination of some classrooms that are larger, uh, predominantly using our gym or multi-purpose room space and breaking that up into smaller rooms or smaller areas, media centers, art rooms, music rooms, any of our bigger spaces. Uh, so. If the thought is my first grader is gonna be able to go to school all day, every day, and they're gonna be in their traditional first grade classroom, that's highly unlikely. Um, they'll either be in an art room, a music room, a divided gymnasium to make it work. So we've ran that scenario as well. Um, <clears throat> we also have another group that uh, is getting up and starting to work, uh, and they're, ex they're exploring to, uh, you know, is there, how can we open up all day, every day for students that may uh, have the most significant needs. So our students with disabilities, our, our students you know, title, that get Title I services, English learners, all, all student groups that you can think of that may benefit, all students would benefit from all day, every day, right? Um, but if we have to prioritize, those are the scenarios that they're, they're working through. So those are some of the updates that I wanted to share in terms of where we're at and some of the work that we're doing for in-person, in-building learning. Um, and where some of the conversations are at right now. I'll pause here to see if there's any. You can't remember a question in regards yeah. to, you talked about potentially the kindergarten, first grade, and second grade being able to go back and obviously utilizing all the different spaces, the, the art room and music and gym and so forth. If that is the, if that's an option and, and something we decided to, to look into more, would there be a need for additional um, staff and teachers to because of that scenario, or would it be physically taking a class out of uh, a smaller classroom and putting it into a, a gymnasium or something else? It's, it's the second. So it's taking a class. It wouldn't need any additional staffing. 
because we're taking a class that would require one teacher and moving it to a spot where they could all fit with the social distancing requirements. So um, the only scenario where it would require more teachers is, you know, the one scenario is we divide all of the kids into smaller groups if we had the space to do so. That would require a second teacher because, you know, the, if we have a group of 12 and a group of 13, we need two staff members. If, because they're going to be in different locations, we'd need two staff members. But when you take, you know, like, like this room here, you know, a, a 5,000 square foot space, you know, I can fit 30 kids in about 1,100 square feet. Um, you know, I can, I can take this and divide this up into two or three classrooms and have one teacher with the 25 kids or whatever it may be. So in that scenario, no additional staffing. That makes sense. Thank you. So what would happen to the empty room that they would be moving from then? It, it depends in the building. Uh, for some of them, uh, a, a class. So if, if I'm a third grade classroom and I just happen to have a lot of square footage, uh, I'm going to take a first grade classroom, put them in the third grade classroom, and the third grade classroom is going to go to first because I only need space for 12 or 13 kids in that blended learning schedule. Um, a, lo a lot of the, so that's one thing that would happen. Um, and then the other thing that happens is we have to keep, I, I should have clarified this. So this would, this would be put into effect in a blended learning model. So we'd have, at the elementary level, conceptually, we'd have K to 2 coming every day. And we'd need to make sure that they're in spaces that nobody else needs or it can be used in different ways. Three to five would be coming in, uh, not every day, but in a rotating schedule. So we need to make sure that we're not using the three to five rooms at all. Um, what this also precipitates is that if we do this, art is not going to be in the art room, it's going to be in the classroom. You know, all those names I mentioned, art, music, PE, they're, they're going to be in the classroom or uh, in an alternative setting or outside for physical education classes. It also necessitates, I don't believe any building has a plan that doesn't have use of a large area like this to make it work. That means that lunch is going to be in the classroom. So one of the work groups we talked about today is how do we build in movement breaks or um, opportunities for kids not to sit in the same seat in the same room from 9 to 3.30 at the elementary level. But for all of these decisions, there's trade-offs, and you have to prioritize is what's the greater need. Is the greater need getting our earliest and youngest learners in five days a week every day? And that means we're saying art, music, and PE are important, but we feel comfortable having them provided in an alternative manner. Um, or do we feel that movement is the most important throughout the day? And that means all K to five is on a blended learning schedule. Kids are going to go to school two days a week instead of five days a week because we feel having a kid sit in, having a student sit in a desk in a room for all seven and a half hours is not in the best interest of the student. So in all of these decisions, we have competing interests, and ultimately we need to decide which interest provides the greatest benefit to the greatest number of students. Thank you. Moving on to blended learning. So blended learning, again, is a combination where uh, not all students could go to school every day because of the social distancing requirements. So again, not to be redundant, but if six feet social distancing remains a rule that we have to adhere to, we have to go to a blended learning structure. And what that means, you know, it's a variation on the theme. We sent out a survey. You've seen what other schools are doing. It's how are we going to divide up the, the week into groups of students two groups of students, because we, we have enough space where if we divide the groups into two, we can fit that. Um, and what type of schedule is that going to be where students are going to rotate, where part of the week they'll get in-person instruction and part of the week they'll get remote learning. And so we are still working through some options. Uh, we've, we have finalized our decision on what the schedule will be uh, for students and how we'll group students and what days of the week they'll be. Uh, we are still finalizing some discussions internally about aspects of that. So I have a community conversation on Tuesday, and so on Tuesday I'll go more in depth into what that schedule will look like, the days of the week it will be, how we're working to divide students. Um, so within the next five days, people will understand if we have a blended learning schedule, here's what it will look like uh, for my family. Any questions on the blended learning aspect just that I want to highlight again we have lanes lane number one is all students back together 
Lane two is the blended learning option. Lane three is, is remote learning. So even though you'll be announcing on Tuesday that this is what blended learning it looks like, it's important to remind everyone that it's an if situation. Right. And so, you know, as I've, uh, thank you for reiterating that, Rich, and, you know, I, the analogy I use is we've got three plans on the bookshelf, and whatever the rules are, we need to be ready to pull the right, have the right plan ready to pull off the bookshelf to implement. Um, and so that's the work we're doing now and throughout the summer um, so that we're ready for that and, and can be successful. Uh, so lane number three, going with that theme, is remote learning. Um, and so this is a current focus of the work groups. You know, once we've gotten through the blended learning uh, uh, structure and schedule, uh, this is what they're working on right now, and that they're working on two aspects. How does this integrate and marry with a blended structure? You know, what does remote learning look like when I have students part of the week, and then I'm going to uh, assign assignments later, you know, for other aspects? You know, we think about this is a lot of how college works now. You know, or even if you think of in-person college, like I went to Ohio State, we had lecture and we had recitation. You know, you have kind of, here's the big group instruction and then the, the small group breakout sessions. We've had in the past blended learning English classes where there's flexibility of we're going to do in-person a couple days a week and you're going to do remote a couple days a week. So that's one aspect of the plan that they're working on. And I just want to assure families, we've heard your feedback loud and clear that you want live instruction, you want teacher instruction, you, you know, and that's things that they're working on. They're working on aspects of, can I really provide, if I'm a student that's in school on day one, or I'm a student in, at home at day one, can I log in and experience the same instruction on Monday, whether I'm in person or I'm at home? Those are things that we're working on, and we believe we have possibilities of implementing those at different levels. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that they're, they're working on right now. The other scenario that they're working on, as I talked about, is if we get shut down. If we have to go to remote learning for a period of the year, five days a week, what's that going to look like? As, a, as an educator and a teacher, it's a completely different structure. If I know I'm going to see Michelle a couple days a week, I've got a different way I'm going to maneuver and, and use remote learning. But if I'm never going to see you except but virtually, that's a whole different concept. Foundationally, it's similar, right? But it's a different way of approaching teaching and a different way of approaching uh, education in a remote setting. Um, and so it's going to be more, uh, significantly more structured than it was uh, last year or, or in, in the spring. Um, and so that is lane three, is remote learning in a blended and remote learning as a complete remote learning environment. Is there a possibility for a lane four where that might address the needs of the students who don't feel safe coming back regardless? There is. And so I will share that on the next slide. Uh, it, that's a great transition. I just wanted to make sure. And she, and she didn't see the slides before. We're just so in sync. So in sync. Questions on the blended learning before I move on to lane four? Okay. So, so lane four is exactly that. So what we, we've called it the Strongsville Academy um, we're, in the past. We're calling it now the Strongsville Online Learning Option. Um, SOLO, which it works, doesn't it? The acronym works. I did. We, we did. We, we came up with it. So, uh, so, so anyway, thank you. See, see, you picked up on it already. It was a different last term, and I said, if we make that option, it makes solo. It, it works. Uh, but we do want to give that fourth lane. Um, it, is, it, it is a part of our process, but, uh, but one of the things I want to remind our community is that we've had an online learning option for probably the last three to four years for everybody K to 12. Um, we, we, we started that because we were seeing an uptick of students going to e-schools. Um, and uh, we wanted, educationally, we wanted to provide that service, and also it keeps local tax dollars in, in our district, uh, and so it was a financial benefit as well, so, so we, we started that. We, ex we are projecting an expansion of this based on uh, what M Michelle talked about. So um, Erin Green, our director, director of curriculum, she's done phenomenal work. She has developed a plan um, for what this could look like K to 12, um, and when we talk about a plan, um, there's a couple things that I want to make sure families are aware. You know, one of the things we talked a lot about as, the, as a district is that we wanted to put a focus on asynchronous learning. 
Asynchronous learning is a fancy term for you can access it at any time. It's recorded instruction. You can watch a video. Uh, of your, it's the YouTube of our kids' generation, right, that I can access content anytime I want. Synchronous is, just means it's live. You know, we're, we're working together. So I just want to um, make sure our community understands as we start to go down this road is that the majority of the uh, online learning platforms, whether you go and, and withdraw and enroll in another online learning district or with us, are asynchronous. You're watching videos, you're reading, um, and there's a live teacher to check in, but the li you're not logging on to see a live teacher do a science lesson and you learn with the live teacher. It is video-based, you know, self-paced instruction. So um, if, if families are looking and saying, well, you know, Strongsville didn't provide live instruction, that's what I want, I want to go to the Strongsville online learning option, um, and these are third-party providers that we contract with, that's not what you're going to get completely. Um, so there's a lot of decisions in there too. You, there's one price if you have a teacher providing, uh, you know, kind of in the background support. There's one price, you know, if you don't. There's also we're doing a cost-benefit analysis once we get numbers to see would it be better for us to hire a teacher that's going to oversee these platforms at different grade levels versus contracting that service out. So we have also developed a survey. It's an interest survey. Um, and we'll be sending that out on Tuesday to all of our families. And it's not a commitment. It's just saying, for the reasons that you stated, there, there's families that are saying, hey, until a, until a vaccine is developed, um, my, my child's not coming back to school, or I'm just too anxious about all the restrictions or masks or whatever it may be, um, that they want to go online. So this is an interest survey. It's going to help us to plan accordingly, because there's a cost to this for the district. Um, it will help us out to plan, like, will we see so many students that take advantage that will reduce class sizes to maybe where classes could fit all day, every day, because we've gotten down to 16 to 17 students in a grade level at a building. Um, but, uh, so we'll send that out on Tuesday. The one thing that is not going to change, and I can share definitively, when we roll this out to parents and you commit, you are committing for a semester. We are, and that's pretty much standard what a lot of our neighboring districts are doing. The reason being is we cannot, we cannot manage the numbers of kids continuing to go back month to month. So just keep that in mind as you, as you think what's best for your children, what's best for your family. If you take, if you take us up on lane four uh, and the online option, you are committing from the start of the school year through uh, winter break. And after that, you can decide to come back. Um, and we're going to have you commit a semester at a time. So we'll send that out and get some interest. Cameron, is there, a, I guess, the opposite of that, where somebody starts deciding they want to go to school or, or blended, whatever scenario they are, and then switch to the online? Is that possible, or that, can that only be done at the semester time frame? We haven't gotten into that much detail yet, um, but just my, my feeling of it is, is it's, I'm fine with going into it. It's the coming out that let, makes it a little more difficult, especially if we have requirements and class sizes and things of that nature. And, and the other part of it, too, uh, is that the courses are built on semesters. So what we also don't want to have happen is that they're taking third grade math. They do that for a few months. They come back to live third grade instruction, and we're at a different pace. It's still the same curriculum, right? But we could be in a different pace. It's just not educationally sound for kids to keep bouncing back and forth. Um, so uh, they would get through a full semester of third grade math, and then it's a nice breaking point for them to come back to school. And I, think it, I think it's warranted just to mention, you know, we're trying to balance being customer service friendly. We're trying to balance being uh, respectful of each parent and their students, uh, how they're looking at this COVID situation. But we also have to plan. And to have people jumping back and forth to, you know, to just say, hey, a week before school starts, let us know which way you want to go. There's too much to juggle. We do need to plan. So I think the survey is a great way to get started to find out, you know, thing, things like if there is a, a large percentage of parents who want this option, that does mean, you know, some of our uh, issues with five foot versus six foot distance could be radically different. Yeah. Um, and I think the bus is the other one that uh, 
not, uh, struggle's the wrong word, but the bus, busing is going to be an issue in how we deal with that. It is. Um, so we can get started with that survey and, and find out whether we need to drill down deeper or not. Yeah. Does the bus uh, issue happen to be on that survey, or is that something we're going to address later? We don't have it on the survey. One of the things that's very confusing right now, I mean, we're all getting a lot of mixed messages, right? There's, there's one set of rules for one group, and there's another set of rules for another group. So we're all experiencing that challenge. We haven't got transportation and busing clarity has not been defined yet. So what I would like to do is just to pause a little bit on that one. Uh, because again, there's been rumors that, you know, they, the state understands the real challenges we have with socially distancing on busing and um, that there's, there's discussion that it may be allowed to, to, to alleviate the social distancing requirements but require everybody to wear masks. So I think we need to get clarity from the transportation rules and then we can send out a survey. And just to confirm, the, the survey that's going out Tuesday is just an interest survey. You're not committing to anything Correct. at this time, just yep. if you're interested in it. Yeah, this is just an interest survey to let us know. Um, and, I, and I think what it helps also is this is probably when one of the more popular questions I've received is, uh, and so I think it will help get it out there officially with everybody that this is an option. The, the uh, last couple of things were just some miscellaneous items. Um, you know, one of the things we've been talking about in one of our work groups is adjustments to the district calendar. Um, and so we've reached uh, somewhat of a recommendation conceptually. Um, and I will be uh, sharing that on Tuesday as well. So we got some good feedback. We could share definitively so people can use the calendar to plan and understand. Uh, what I'll be able to share on Tuesday is, you know, here, here, here's the latest your kids are going to start. Here's the earliest your kids are going to start. You know, here's what we're doing with breaks and all of those other things. So. Um, as I've shared with the committee today, this is truly a recommendation um, because as superintendent, there's a procedure. We have to go through a calendar committee and then ultimately the board approves the calendar. Uh, so that's something that we'll talk about and I'll talk about it in terms of a recommendation, uh, but ultimately the board is gonna have to approve an adjusted calendar based on those recommendations. So that should probably happen in July sometime. Uh, the, the other thing that I just wanted to update the board is, you know, Seth, you talked about potential cost. The potential cost that we're projecting right now, if we keep everything in district, um, uh, is there would be some increased staffing cost. Uh, two areas where we would see possibility of increased staffing. Um, if we decide to go with the K-2 to two option uh, that we bring back all day, every day, Whitney is the only building that I cannot make it work based on the classroom sizes and the available space. So Mr. Stacko had a great option uh, other than taking students from Whitney and dispersing them in open rooms across the city or bringing them here to have school, um, you know, he came up with a great option and it would require one additional staff member to make that option uh, work. Um, so we'll be looking at that. The other staffing increase that, and again, this is all tentative, right? I just wanted to be transparent in what we're talking about. Um, I've asked Mr. Breckner and the head custodians to do an analysis of how, could they disinfect and clean the buildings on a nightly basis uh, to assure that all high touch surfaces and classroom desks and furniture is disinfected to a standard that uh, is acceptable and, and necessary. Um, he said yes we can do it, but he would need an additional evening custodian at each of our five elementary buildings. Um, so if you take a look at a lot of our elementary buildings, we have one, maybe one and a part and an additional half of an evening custodian. Uh, so to do the level of disinfection, and, and this also means I know I'm talking in different areas, but I think it's important to note that when, when our kids come back, the classrooms are not going to look like the classrooms that they left. And so we're talking about management practices and structural processes, but there's an emotional component to this. You know, kids are gonna come in and see a classroom that's pretty empty with spread out desks and a teacher desk. And we've told our teachers that until further notice, your reading nooks, your, your, you know, your furniture that you bring in to make it a classroom community, it can't come back. It's been sent home and it can't come back because we cannot disinfect all of these surfaces each and every day. Um, so we're also working on, um, you know, how do we help transition our students back to an environment that's very different than, than what they left. 
Um, but to, to make it work at the elementary level, we would need additional custodial support. Uh, we feel that we're fine at the middle school and high school. Um, however, uh, we would have to, uh, in House Bill 164, which is a new law that was passed that uh, addressed uh, restrictions for, uh, and kind of some reprieves for rules and laws for schools, the one thing that didn't make the final bill was giving districts the ability to close their buildings down after hours for non-school events. So that was something that I lobbied for as a superintendent and we lobbied for. Not that we want to lock down our, our school district from our taxpayers that pay for it, but we're just saying right now it's really difficult to manage school, let alone opening up our doors. Our high school and middle school never stop. And so the concern is, and we're going to have to have further discussion about maybe we prioritize days of the week or that, but the other caveat is, is if we open up our buildings for outside groups, I'm not talking about internal sports or internal music groups or what have you. I'm saying if, if we rent it out to, you know, community group X, Y, or Z, we do not have the workforce to disinfect those areas because those areas don't clear until 10, 11 o'clock at night. And so those are some of the challenges that we have. The other cost that is going to, we're going to have to incur is a furniture cost. And this is pretty much an elementary cost. Um, right now, all of our kindergarten classrooms have tables with chairs around them. You cannot socially distance to the level we need to in kindergarten classrooms with tables and chairs. Um, so we would need um, you know, additional furniture that would be accessible for kindergarten students to sit at that would allow us to socially distance. Um, so what, what all of our principals are doing this week is they're um, working with the appropriate directors to, to share what furniture needs that they would need and also what technology equipment we would need. Um, and so when we talk about can we create an environment where students can log in at home and see live instruction, that takes equipment to make that happen. That equipment could be as simple as a webcam. But the other thing that we're fighting against is everybody is looking for the same stuff. You know, so, so the Chromebooks that we ordered, instead of getting here in mid-July, they're going to get here mid-late August. You know, so these are things that we've got to be on top of so we, um, so we can get the orders in. So th those are some of the additional costs. I, I also want to mention, and I know it'll be on the next agenda, uh, but the district did get uh, CARES Act funding, 370-some thousand, 50-some thousand, George? Yeah. Our share about, in total, is slightly over 400000 but our share of it is uh, about $372,000. Um, the rest goes to the uh, non-public schools. So when you talk about some of the items I've listed, we've built that into our CARES funding plan. So when we talk about the expansion of on online learning, we've allocated a portion of that to the CARES Act funding. When you talk about technology upgrades and equipment, we've allocated that some of that to the CARES Act funding. So um, we're able, you know, up to 370 some thousand dollars, we're able to take some of these costs we're going to incur based on COVID. We're going to be able to, instead of using, you know, it's all taxpayer dollars in some respect, it, uh, but instead of taking the locally generated taxpayer dollars that are for the purpose of day-to-day -day operations, we're able to utilize these additional dollars to pay for some of these additional costs because of that. So those were just some miscellaneous items that I wanted to share. And, and the last slide is just a reminder that uh, we put it out to, to our families, um, but we do want to keep uh, open communication. And as long as people are understanding that we're going to share kind of where we're at and what we're working on, and sometimes that causes a little anxiety um, but, uh, and uncertainty, but we think that's a better option uh, than holding it all back to early August and sharing it all at once. When we have decisions, we're going to share those decisions with you. So this first one starts on June 23rd. They'll, it'll start at 4 p.m. All of them will start at 4 p.m. And then we'll get into a pattern of every other Tuesday. So every other Tuesday from June 23rd to August 18th, the dates are there. We'll have uh, a live community conversation. Um, we'll email the links prior. Um, we're going to change the format depending on where we're at. Um, so some of them may be li me live talking, but not interactive, uh, because to be honest, right now I don't. I have there's more questions than answers. So, I, you know, it's a, 
to have that conversation and continue to say, I don't know right now, I don't know right now. Um, uh, but, you know, and some of those will evolve and be live and include other people beyond just myself. Um, but we'll have those up and going and we'll email the links uh, like we have in the past to folks so that they can tune in. So um, that's the uh, update uh, and discussion I wanted to have with the board and always open to your feedback. So if you have any feedback or guidance uh, or questions that we can answer now or get feedback to you, I, that would be wonderful to, to continue the conversation. So I was just going to say, th A, thank you for the report. I think it uh, answered a lot of questions and gave some clarity, as much clarity as one can possibly give at this time. Um, but I think it's nice that we're doing the community conversations and that we have a cadence. And I would suggest if people want to see the sausage being made while we're going through it, uh, attend all of them. If uh, you just want to know the final decision, uh, wait until August. Um, you don't need to uh, to spend your time uh, at each meeting, and you know I think that's fine for uh, each person. We said before that our primary option is all our kids in school all the time, and I think it's important that we share that with the community. That is our our drive. Uh, we need to balance being able to do that and do it safely, and you know. I think in all of our in all of our uh, living rooms and in all of our kitchens, it's it's fine, and everyone's having that conversation. Are we doing too much? Are we doing too little? Uh, are we you know are masks good? Are masks bad? Is physical distance required? Is physical distance uh, you know not uh, beneficial? Do kids get sick with COVID? Don't they get sick with COVID? And that's all fine in our in our living rooms and our kitchens, but. In our boardroom and in the in the school district, we have to make actionable decisions. And so, again, our primary option is to bring our kids back to school five days a week. However, that looks, we truly believe for their educational benefit, the best thing for them is to be back in our schools. We'll get the guidance from the state and we'll act accordingly. You know, I, I'm watching every little bit. I talked with Cameron earlier in the week. Uh, you know, in Ohio, it's six feet. The World Health Organization, I did verify, it's simply one meter or three feet is their recommendation. But their recommendation has an asterisk saying, or more if you can do more. Uh, in Germany, it's one and a half meters, which coincidentally is five feet. <laughs> Not that I'm saying Germany, Australia, Denmark, and uh, Austria know something that we don't. But we need to be practical. Um, I think five feet could be workable, and I think it would be reasonable. But at the same time, if the state comes down, we'll have to pivot and act accordingly. And the same thing with masks, the same thing with washing hands, the same thing with whatever procedures we do. But I I know our children are very resilient. and. Uh, are up to whatever task we ask of them. We're not gonna ask them to do something that um, they can't do. But I think, you know, if I, I think if we surveyed our students, they wanna be back in school, whether it's a little bit spread out, whether it's, uh, you know, following different rules on how to walk down the halls. Um, you know, in the elementary school, our teachers spend a lot of time with our young ones, teaching them how to walk down the hallways as it is. So. They're just going to learn new cadences for walking down hallways and going to the lunchroom and art class, et cetera. I remember growing up in grade school, our art class was in the classroom uh, all the time as it is. And this is, I think it's also important to remember this, this is going to be a short period of time. When it's all over, we will consider it a short period of time. Right now, it feels like it's never ending. Um, but I, I do want to compliment the team um, for doing uh, all of the, the work that we're doing. It is more bandwidth, time, et cetera, to bring the community in for that conversation. But it, I think it is the right way for us to do it, to make sure we have a, uh, a plurality of opinions and we can see what other people are thinking and come up with other ideas. Um, but again, our, our primary option is to get our kids back in school, and I think that's the best for us. I will share I, the exercise, and I know the board challenged you to do the exercise to find out, you know, uh, what it would take to get that extra space if we wanted to, if we had to do the six feet, et cetera. 
Um, I do think it becomes unwieldy real quick when, when all the dominoes get added. But I do think it was a worthwhile exercise, you know, whether it's Whitney or what have you, maybe we do rent one or two things mm -hmm. to make it work and make it happen. We now know how to tap that yeah. and get that going. Anyone else have questions, comments? We're gonna have an exciting summer. Well, yes, we do. Okay, uh, next on our agenda, we do have need for a second executive session on the topic of? To consider matters required to be kept confidential by law. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? <laughs> motion by Mr. Roberts, second by uh, Ms. Sully. Mrs. Sully, any discussion? Mr. Anagnostu. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mrs. Salee? Yes. Mrs. Bissell? Yes. Mr. Miko? Yes. And Mrs. Housem? Yes. We will go into public session at 8.35. Executive. 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 What did session. I say? Public. Oh, well, thank you for correcting me. We will go into public session, or uh, <laughs> We'll go into executive <laughs> session at 8.35 p.m. We have no reason for uh, the public's business afterwards. Uh, congratulations, Sherry. Welcome aboard, and we'll see you in a week. Thank you very much. Thank you.